three, three, two, and one. Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast on this Rocky Top Rewind edition with Austin Price, Rob Lewis, and Jesse Simonton. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us. Don't forget to check out our uh, don't forget to check out our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. You can find them online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com, or you can check them out on Twitter at Blue h 20 underscore climate. They got all the things you need uh, for your system to improve uh, allergies in your house. So be sure to check them out online for all the details that we'll talk about that a little bit later and a little bit more. Let's dive into this game, guys. Pretty interesting game for Tennessee. We did the 95 Alabama game and the significance of that win for Philip Fulmer and the program. They cap off that year by winning the 1996 Citrus Bowl against an Ohio State team that had they not blown a game to Michigan, would have been in the Rose Bowl with a chance to play for uh, a national title. Obviously, no playoff back then, but they would have had a chance to be in a share for the national title. Upon rewatch, just give me your initial thoughts. Somebody jump in there. <laughs> what an incredible amount of talent in this game. I just, I mean, certainly, you know, Tennessee, a lot of guys, you know, we're familiar with Peyton at the top of the list, but, you know, Marcus Nash was a first round pick. Bubba Miller played for a decade in the league. Joey Kent played, Jeff Smith played, Peerless Price played, Terry Fair was a first round pick, Litter Little, and then um, Al Wilson. Grace. Al Wilson uh, with the, with the with the hit stick on the first play of the game on the kickoff. The, front, the kickoff, yeah, and then just good gracious. I mean, Ohio State had the Heisman Trophy winner, one of the best offensive linemen to ever played the game of football in Orlando Pace. Terry Glenn, I think, was the 13th pick in the draft. Ricky Vrabel was a, was a stud. Mike Vrabel, just I mean. Well, I mean, I, I knew it, but I mean, just to go back and see all, I mean, just all the names that, that uh, Sean Springs, first round draft pick, quarterback, just tons and tons of talent. It was incredible. You know, it's funny, Austin. We, we, we caught up with Bill Duff, who'll join us, uh, and, and we'll have that in the latter part of the podcast here. Ask him this question Was that the most talent? Was that the most talent you had been on the field with? And he said yes. Uh, which that includes some Florida teams through his tenure at Tennessee that were pretty loaded with some talent as well. Uh, so it certainly was a, a big talent, uh, you know, a lot of talent on that field. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from Bill Duff a little bit later about his his recall of the game. A couple of fun stories from Duff. You want to catch up? You want to stay tuned and listen to that in just a little bit? I promise you. Yeah, you know, those Florida teams had Javon Curse and, and some others, but Ohio State literally had guys. I mean, like they had guys on both sides of the ball, special teams. That, that played for a long, 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 long time in the NFL. I mean, you know, Redell Anthony, you know, he had a solid NFL career uh, with, with, with uh, you know, a couple of different teams. Ike Hilliard, you know, obviously did decent with the Giants. But, like, when you really look at, like, there are some Hall of Famers on that Buckeyes team yeah, and, and well, just I mean, some great players. And then there's some some guys like a Terry Glenn who had just a, a really, really good NFL career. I mean, he's not a Hall of Famer, but he's also – uh, a guy that, you know, played for a long, long time. Well, piggybacking on that, I mean, Rob listed, I mean, they, they, I think this this game had almost a dozen first-round draft picks between both sides, maybe more than that. Uh, but think about the fact that Eddie George, coming off winning the Heisman, he in the, t- flash forward 20 years, 25 years, he doesn't play in this game. The Citrus Bowl, he doesn't play in this game. He had 25 carries in like a slog, you know, in a game that was – pretty you know ultimately quote unquote meaningless in terms of how people view these bowl games now at the time it was not meaningless it was very important uh to both tennessee and ohio state my kind of overarching takeaway though i wrote down uh these just kind of just how sloppy it was there was six combined fumbles 14 combined penalties each team had fewer than 350 yards of total offense 16 punts one of which was blocked and the, and the two teams combined for eight of 29 on third down. I mean, it was just a defensive kind of slobber knocker where basically Tennessee made two huge offensive plays. Joey Kent with the nice uh, back shoulder, you know, spin, and obviously Jay Graham with, with the long touchdown. And then they got the stop with Bill Duff and all the fumbles in the fourth quarter. I mean, it was it was an ugly football game. It was. Yeah, which, but, but, go ahead, uh, Austin. Wait, I was going to say, which, you know, when you look back at this game, it, a lot of that dictated by the weather. But you're right. If you really go back to, to me, the game swung on the, the goal line stand and the subsequent big run by Jay. Because, I mean, those happened back to back. And, um, you know, to me, was really the 
I won't say the backbreaker, but at the same time, it really to me, to me gave Tennessee the jolt of confidence that it needed. Yeah, there, there was, was a, a series there, in there, Yeah, there yeah, was, was a series say, between. The, the interesting thing that was is, equal. Yeah, that that I mean, Tennessee gets to stop and has to punt. Ohio State has decent field position, can't do anything with it. The the stunner of all that when when I went back and rewatched that game uh, was the fact that Ohio State gave up those two runs to Jay to end the half essentially. I mean, because you're, you're playing prevent there, right? I mean, the fact that Jay Graham got loose for that long of a run uh, is pretty incredible when you think about it. To steal to steal a touchdown uh, with with less than a minute to go in the half uh, was pretty remarkable. That Ohio State's defense would give that up. Yeah, and that was. I mean, the run was obviously huge, but you, you kind of get lost in the shuffle because, as you point out, after the goal line stop, where, where Duff got George behind the line of scrimmage. Ohio State did have good field position, and Tennessee gets a three and out that was huge. To uh, you know, that, that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah, the other thing that came out of this game, post game, out of this deal, was Ohio State's claim that Tennessee wore illegal cleats. That Tennessee had, they went at in at halftime and put on cleats that were not allowed because they were too long. Too long. Right, and so that was the big hubbub afterwards. Max Perot tells a great story that Doug Dickey, the then athletic director, came in just to ask Max straight up. And Max Perot tells it, he goes, I've never had anyone look into my soul, but that man <laughs> looked into my soul in the locker room. They goes, I couldn't have lied to him if I wanted to because, like, it was like I was, like, paralyzed because he looked. And that was anybody who's ever had any dealings with, with Doug Dickey will tell you that. That's his, that's his persona. I mean, he could be a, you know, a big imposing figure. Mike was still a pretty young kid right then, you know, getting started in his career uh, as an equipment guy. And he, he'll to this day say, I've never had anybody look into my soul the way Doug Dickey did. But Ohio State, you know, a little sour grapes afterwards complaining that Tennessee had better footing they did than they did because of uh, Ill- illegal cleats, which is a nice, funny 25 years later sidebar to that story. Tennessee comes out of this game, capping off obviously a big year where they beat Alabama and in the streak. Tennessee then finds themselves on the cover of Sports Illustrated in the summer as as the number one team in the country. Uh, they were ranked by several people as the number one team in the country. So while you're right, Jesse, this was in today's world would be a meaningless bowl game where Orlando Pace he probably walking out, looking at the rain, going, you know what, guys, I think I'm going to put on a raincoat and stand on the sidelines. Same with Eddie George and some of those guys like that. But for Tennessee in this game, it was a huge statement to the national media that Tennessee was really moving in an upward mobility because they had lost to Florida earlier in the year, but they led 31-14 at the half, and they had played with everybody. Now, they got blew out in the second half against Florida but they had played with everybody all year long. It catapulted Tennessee into the summer with a ton of talk about Tennessee winning a national championship. So, so the game carried a lot, a lot of meaning for, for Tennessee uh, on that front. I was impressed, and again, we, we talked about this a little bit in the Alabama Rewind. I think this, this game, though, is another statement about the direction that Philip Fulmer was taking the program with his defensive front seven, how aggressive they were going to play in blitzing, you know, and obviously just the, the play and the athletic ability that they had on the defensive front really started to show up in this game to me. Well, well on, this on, was the first the year that, that John Chavis was the, the defensive coordinator, and we all know right. Chief loved to bring to bring pressure, use guys in, in, in a myriad of different ways. So, um, yeah, this was that first year that, that he really kind of got to be the guy as far as calling the defense. So I think that, you know, I won't say that in this moment or this particular game that they really kind of took on his persona or what he wanted to do, but I think you could clearly see all year long, and in particular in this game, that they were wanting to get more aggressive with what they were doing. You know what you could make a a cut-up of this game of, like, the old, you know, NFL primetime jacked up, like they used to do, like, you got jacked up, like the whole, like, with Chris Carter screaming. There was so many hits in this game where guys would have been ejected. Like in, in today's – King had one on the in, in on the fourth quarter kickoff where he basically decapitated the, the poor guy from Ohio State, and he ends up being the guy that makes, you know, the ultimate fumble recovery that, that, that wins the game. Um, I thought a big – obviously it was a key play 
But I thought kind of an underrated moment of the game was Tennessee gets that stop with Bill Duff in the first half. You know, he basically was unblocked. I, I literally took a screenshot of the play. They had an eight, basically an eight, six numbers advantage and knew that Ohio State was going over there, uh, you know, to the, to that side. Um, but fourth quarter, kind of, you know, it's at the 50-yard line. Ohio State calls an option play. Oh with yeah, their, with, with their with their on, back with their backup fullback because on fourth uh, and one <laughs> on fourth and one because Shulula is out and and I mean it was just a disaster from the beginning. They clearly they don't run the option. They hadn't run the option the whole the whole game previously, uh, and that ended up being a big game, a, you know, a huge play because even though Tennessee didn't give any points out of uh, that turnover. They were able to kind of again, kind of grind out a little bit of the clock with a few runs from Jay. Yeah, that was yeah, I, that was a classic too many meetings, Rob. Yeah, and um, and kind of on you know on top of that, just I, I would call that a bad play call for execution. I thought Ohio State a couple of things that are you know obviously easy to overlook. Twenty five years later, uh, two big penalties in the in the kicking game. The rough in the kicker that they that Ohio State had. The, immediately Tennessee, the next play comes back, and that's the touchdown to Kent. You know, Ohio State's defense is off the field right there. Tennessee doesn't get that touchdown without the penalty. And then later on in the third quarter, Ohio State had returned a punt it, slightly into Tennessee's territory around midfield. They get a um, personal foul penalty, backs them all the way back up to the 30, and they don't get any points out of that drive. So two two kind of little details there that were really hurt them. To me, to me, this game was one of those classic games where, you know, Ohio State was super talented, and they showed – enough with flashes that you, you, the whole game, if you're a Tennessee fan, you just kept waiting on the dam to break, you know, uh, and them to, 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 them to be able to do something. But Tennessee kept finding ways to either, you know, get stops or, you know, slow Ohio State down some. Um, it just to me, it was a, a really good game plan all the way around. But like I said, you could see the flashes, and Rob's talking about it right there, that, you know, they were so close on a myriad of different times. That's twice I've used the word myriad on this podcast, um, but twice that they were they were close to doing a couple of nice things, and and each time Tennessee was able to really kind of just either s- slow them down to where it, you know they just couldn't get a ton of momentum. No, they that, did. That play that play that Jay Graham hits for a touchdown though is one of the most like unfrequent plays that happens in both college and the NFL. Bill Barnwell uh, of ESPN did a big study several years ago about how basically inside the final minute or 30 seconds when teams just hand the ball off, there's actually a greater likelihood that the player gets hurt, that the running back gets hurt, or he commits a turnover, a fumble, you know, something, than actually scoring some sort of long, you know, 70-yard touchdown. So that gave Tennessee such juice heading into to halftime where they did feel like, okay, you know, we got the stop. We were down 7 nothing. Um you know, and, and it was just it was it was a monumental play, and and obviously Jay went on to win uh, MVP of the, of the game because of that long run. Yeah, it was um, it was nasty, nasty, nasty weather, uh, and really wet. And uh, Jay, I mean Jay, that offensive line, Rob did enough. I mean they they yeah. were good enough. That really stood out to me going back and watching. I mean certainly the offensive line, give them give them credit for creating some space. But man, I, I would I'd like to see the number for how many yards Jay had a contact in this game because it was uh, it, he was taking some shots and and staying upright and, and getting downfield I was really impressed um, that, that's probably individually he may have stood out more to me than anybody going back and rewatching it and just kind of remembering what, yeah, what he the, got done that game the other thing that I'm, I'm reminded of too in that deal is how much further along as a receiver Joey Kent was to everybody else on that team Nash made a couple of plays, but you could tell he was still a young player. He he had a couple of drops. I mean, when, when Tennessee had to have a play, it was the Joe. It was Joey Kent. The other thing that jumped out to me was the trust that 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 Peyton had in the passing game. And there's a couple times he throws a little flare out to Jay Graham that I'm not even sure Peyton's even looking at him. He, I mean, he leads him so far out there. Uh, and then I've always hated the pirouette wide receiver screen play that that Tennessee has run, but but. You could see again, you know, Peyton was great at Alabama. We talked about that, but even in these bad, even in these conditions, he, he had pretty good command. I mean, he, he had a couple balls that could have been trouble for him, but overall, he did not put the ball in harm's way uh, the way Hoying did in, in, in that game. Just continuing to show his growth. 
I would have loved to have seen uh, the reaction on the general's quarters in that game broadcast because if Brent Musburger said once that Peyton Manning threw a wobble duck or whatever he just got, I mean, it would have been classic meltdown about, you know, how pro Brent Musburger was as a Big Ten guy and how much he hated Peyton Manning at that point, right? Dick Vermeil Dick Vermeil saying Peyton doesn't, you know, he doesn't ever throw a tight spiral. That's just kind of the way his ball normally looks. It just kind of wobbles out there, but he gets a good arc on it. Musburger and Vermeil were hilarious. Vermeil kind of stuck his foot in his mouth at one time with almost some casual xenophobia when he was talking about the uh, uh, Ohio State fullback. I mean, it was not a broadcast, I think, that, that, that aged well for either one of those guys. That is for sure. I mean, was that like was that like on the cue card, AP, you think, where, where Vermeil was just every time something happened, he was supposed to go, hey in the, in the middle of the broadcast. <laughs> I think those guys just at the end of the day, it was a different time. You know, it was, it, you know, it, pe- people said stuff and it, it just, it, it just two different, two different generations right there. And of course, for, you know, Musburger, you know, as we all know, you know, only got more flamboyant with his speak, uh, you know, in, in a much, in a much tighter generation later on. Culminating, yeah. culminating with his on air love affair with the, who was the AJ? absolutely all right guys as we as we get ready to to wrap this part up here when we catch up with with bill duff here in a couple of minutes and and maybe this is better for rob and austin a little bit jesse you can jump in here because i know you've done some research the 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 significance of this win for tennessee what do you what do you think it was I, i mentioned that they were on you know some magazine covers and and um, the summer, but I mean, how, how important do you think this win was for that, this program at that point in time, Rob? I think it really legitimized Tennessee. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say this game alone legitimized it because I mean, they were coming off a great season. They were in the middle of a great run, but I, I think it really, you know, put Tennessee in, in, in the national consciousness, consciousness as far as an elite program. And they certainly you know, justified that in, in 97, 98, 99 over the next three seasons. And um, I, you know, I don't, I'm not saying none of that happens, you know, without winning this game. But I think from a prestige standpoint, it was um, big time. Because I mean, Ohio State was, you know, a darling in college football, Heisman Trophy winner. You know, Orlando Pace. I, I had to go back and look. I'm pretty sure he was the Outland Trophy winner. That year. he was. And, and Terry Glenn, Terry Glenn won the blue. Won the golf. So I mean, just you know, star-studded Ohio State team that that was, you know, getting all kinds of hype at this point in time. For their program, for Tennessee to go toe to toe with them and win like they did, I, I thought I thought it was pretty significant. Yeah, Ohio State always the uh, the darling out there amongst the national pundits, uh, well, even to this day. Again, and, if, it's, I, if go ahead, go I ahead. was just gonna say I, Tennessee's always been a national brand, but I think that in that era they were, you know, I think that made them a national brand. In that era of the 90s, like to me, it established what, as Rob just said, you know, I mean, Tennessee had had good years, you know, in, in you know, in the early 90s, they've had, you know, obviously a nice year in 95. But I think that made them, you know, a, a national brand in that time. Again, I'm not saying Tennessee wasn't a national brand. I'm just saying, like, I think there's ebbs and flows and you become a national title contender with this win because you became a national title contender the next year, the following year. And then of course, 98 and 99, because remember this is, this is 95 season. So at 96, Tennessee, you know, has, has another nice year. They end up going back to the Citrus Bowl. They beat Northwestern 97. Obviously they played for the national title in the orange bowl, lost to Nebraska, won the national title in 98. And then of course, you know, in 99, we all know what happened at Arkansas or that otherwise they'd probably been playing for two in a row. Yeah, I, Jesse, I think that it probably takes Tennessee out and makes it more national. I, I mean, I know Austin said national brand. It's one thing to beat, you know, Alabama on a Saturday night in, at Legion Field. Everybody in the SEC takes notice of that. But I don't know how much people in the Midwest or, you know, in the Northeast or around the country take notice. Back in the day when we were still dealing with a popularity contest to win the national title, you, you had to be – you had to have people's attention around the country – I think this opened eyes for Tennessee more than just a win over Alabama, even though they were more dominant over Alabama, who was a good team in Legion Field back in October that year. Well, for sure. And the fact that you had some of these guys like the, the Peyton was going to be a junior and that was going to be like, you know, the big the big next season for him in, in 96. And so 
uh, you, you know, you Rob listing off all the talent that Tennessee had. Um, and many of those guys were young guys. Like they weren't going to be drafted this next draft. They were going to be, you know, in, in upcoming drafts. And so I, I certainly it seemed like this was kind of the engine uh, or the ignition to kind of get these next couple of years started, which culminated in a, in a national title a couple of years down the road. Yeah, certainly a big win for Tennessee. We're going to catch up with Bill Duff in just a, a minute or two here to talk about his his remembrance of that win and that season and his time in the program at Tennessee. But first, let me tell you about Blue Water Climate Control. Allergy season is, is here. It's not almost here. It is here. And Blue Water Climate Control offers solutions that protect your airspace in your home. Uh, different things that they can do to control the dirt and dust that accumulates in your system that can reduce efficiency by 30 to 50 percent controlling many of the things in your home that causes you allergy problems inside the home. For more information on that and to schedule a free consultation, give them a call at 865-299-2290, 865-299-2290, Blue Water Climate Control. Don't forget to mention VolQuest when you give them a buzz. Bill Duff coming up next here on the Rocky Top Rewind podcast. Happy to welcome to the program Bill Duff, former Vol Bill Duff. Bill Thanks for joining us. How you doing, my man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me going, guys. All right. Let's talk a little bit about that game itself. Let's talk about the the build up to that game. Here's Ohio State. They had lost to Michigan. Most people thought uh, they they were national champion caliber type team. What was your all's mindset going into that game? What do you remember about the the kind of month long build up to that game? Uh, I just remember them being, you know, as highly as touted as any team I'd, I'd ever played against at that point with a Heisman Trophy winner and a senior quarterback, and that offensive line was absolutely humongous. So we were we were a little concerned how our uh, our faster, speedier, you know, defensive line and 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 uh, linebackers were going to handle a, a Big Ten offensive line of that size and caliber. When you look at them from a talent standpoint, was that, was that as talented of a team as you played against in your time at Tennessee? You played against some really good Florida teams, yeah. some Alabama teams. Where were, I mean, Sean Springs, Orlando Pace, Eddie George, Glenn. I mean, that was a loaded roster. Where would you put their talent level versus other teams you played in your career at Tennessee? They were right up there at the time. I mean, they, they really matched up with Florida, Bama, you know, all, all the best teams. They, 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 they were really good. When you when you your team had a ton of talent on it too, do you, do you all think that the best thing to happen were you know you guys were kind of thought of as underdogs for that entire month and, and everybody just kept talking about the Heisman Trophy win. Well, and Terry John Pickham of the Patriots and all those teams. Yeah, I mean, not Chavis really didn't let. Uh, that kind of stuff into the room. You know, John Chavis was our uh, defense coordinator at the time. Um, and he really practiced the art of intimidation as far as we were the alphas and we were going to take control. And he did a great job with that. Uh, can't give him enough credit. I mean, they just they just got us ready for the game and, and, and kept a lot of the, uh, you know, the locker room stuff and all that talk out of our ears. So I, I give a lot of credit to Fulmer and Chavis for that. So we, we, you know, let's fast forward to the to the big play for you. You, you make the goal line stand. I, you know, we're talking the Bill rehash and you know his play in '98 against Brandon Burlesworth and Arkansas. The season the play that stick with you to this day that you remember kind of just every moment leading up to the snap of the ball and what happened, or you know, did it take you a while to kind of you know really kind of reconnect in that? Um, no, I mean, it was, a, it was a huge play. I think everyone has a play like that in college sure. or high school or, or professionally. Um, and, you know, I can't really go anywhere, uh, especially down in Tennessee or in Ohio, without people saying, you know, I remember your name. And then they put two and two together. And then they'll describe the play to me how they saw it, which is always neat. Uh, because, you know, I lined up against Orlando Pace. So what I saw was a, a monster in front of me. And I said, man, I better shoot the gap or I'm a dead man. Um, and I did. I just shot the gap under his legs. And, you know, I, I don't even think he got off the ball. Um, we got really good at reading their snap count. And I don't think he got off the ball before I was through the gap, which lucky for me, right? Um, 
Yeah, and then it just it just happened, and I flipped out after it happened and took my helmet off, went nuts on the sideline. Greg Johnson still talks about he came up to give me a like a chest bump, and I clotheslined him to the ground. <laughs> I was just like I was going crazy. Even Coach Fulmer said, "Man, Duff, I just had to stay away from you. We don't know what you were doing." But he said um, it energized everyone on the sideline, um, and especially uh, Jay Graham. And I love Jay, and we were good friends. But Jay and me had a healthy competition of, um, I think it started from our freshman camp. Uh, they used to bring the freshmen in alone, just the freshmen. And they put me and Jay up against each other, and I tackled them clean the first time we went up against each other. And he juked me the second time. And I just remember me and him having that healthy competition. And then, of course, um, after the goal line stand, Jay ran for, I want to say, like a 74-yard touchdown, uh, if I'm right. But it was it was unbelievable because when we got in the locker room, I think me and Jay, we must have hugged each other, you know, 10, 15 times, just kind of congratulating each other on great plays. But we knew we had more to do. You know, Bill, it's interesting. I, I rewatched that game um, yesterday, was looking at it. I, I don't think you ever get any credit for the third down play that you helped make on that on the goal line stand. I mean, the fourth down play was the play, obviously, but. On third down, you had penetration in there and rally, you know, kind of forced the ball back inside to let them make a play on third down to prevent a touchdown. What was it about that series? Were you just really that in tune with the snap count? Was it you knew that was a big moment in the game where somebody had to make a play? I mean, that was two back-to-back really big plays in that game. Well, you got to remember, I was a backup at that time. You know, Shane Burton was in front of me. Um, so in a lot of ways, it was fresh legs coming off the bench. And uh, we did a great job at rotating the defensive line. Um, I, you know, teams still do it to this day, especially the NFL's really adopted it. You know, every defensive line has six starters now. And that's that's really how we uh, how we did it. So when I got in there, I was coming off the bench, kind of fresh, ready to go. The other guys were dog ass tired. So at that point, you know, you're next man up. You better step up or. You'll never see the field again with John Chavis. Wettest game you've ever played in? Um, it, was sl- it was sloppy. It was sloppy. It was a very sloppy game. I mean, as far as entertaining games, it was not very entertaining because I've gone back and watched it as well. Uh, it's just – it was one of those – it was a football game, a sloppy-in-the-face football game. And uh, I'm glad I was a part of it, and I'm sure everyone who played in it, even even the Ohio State guys who I meet now, they, they're just glad they were there and – that's kind of how you remember football when you're done with it. So do you go back, you know, and when you hear, talk to those Ohio State guys, and, and we did this, you know, we did our memory vault story on you a couple of years ago, and you talked about then just, you know, the notion that cleats and got the, you know, the thicker, the thick, the thicker uh, spikes, and and you know how much those Ohio State guys still, you know, you know, talked about that after the game. Yeah, I mean, they still stick to that. Eddie George will still stick to that story, but. You know, I I offered him a rematch and he didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bill, for you guys and for Tennessee, I mean, you mentioned where Ohio State was at that point. Um, and I want to get to the post game interview for a minute, cause, in a minute, but I, I want to ask this question first. That game catapulted this program into a different stratosphere. I mean, all the magazine publications the next summer. We're talking about you guys as a number one team, a team that could win the national title. You were a young player in the program. Peyton's still young in the program. Did you realize the magnitude of that win right after the game? Did you realize it in the summer? Did you realize it after the fact that that game put this program in a different national light? I don't think I did because I I came from a high school program that had won – three state titles in the four years I was there. So I expected to win. Um, you know, when I first got to Tennessee and we lost some games, I was like, oh, man, I, I don't know if I made the right call here. Um, but as I started playing and I saw see the, you know, Leonard Little and Peyton and everyone develop around me, I understood, okay, now we have this winning formula that I had seen in high school. Um, prior to that, uh, there wasn't – I mean, Heath did a great job, don't get me wrong. And we had a lot of really talented people, but it never congealed, if you know what I mean. It never really came together where everyone was playing on all cylinders at all times. And I think injuries had a lot to do with that. And, 
you know, you can say as much as you want, but the team that's healthiest at the end of the year is the team that wins the Super Bowl every year. So let's talk about the post-game locker room interview, okay? I mean, this is 1995. It's a little different era in terms of what can be said publicly, what's kind of allowed. That You look at it now, all those rules are relaxed. So here you are on the Vol Network live uh, post-game deal with, with – um, with Mike Keith, and I, and I think your phrase was something to the effect of uh, Orlando Pace and that little white guy were talking a bunch of, of shit is, is the phrase you used. Do, do you even remember Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the reaction? Because that was a storyline after the game, you know, kind of on a local deal. Fans weren't mad, but, you know, some people around the network and around the university like, oh, what are we going to do? Duff, Duff can't be doing all this stuff. It's kind of a, an interesting side note after the fact. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't get a lot of heat for it because of the game itself and the play. So that was good. And um, I, I, unfortunately, like my new jersey comes out, right? I mean, you're going <laughs> to take a kid out of jersey, he's still going to be jersey. And quite honestly, they were talking shit. You know, they so why not tell them exactly that's football, right? You know, you watch Hard Knocks and you watch that kind of stuff on TV. That's football. That's how we talk to each other. And uh, to paint it in any other way is, uh, to me, is painting it untrue. So how, so how good was the trash talk in that game? You know, there wasn't a whole lot, um, but the, the stuff that was there was, you know, you guys are small, you guys are soft, you know, stuff like that. Um, until I think they saw how fast we were. And then the, the chirping really slowed down quite a bit. So, Bill, let's take a look at your career. You you start in, in you know, your first game you play is is last game, of course, is the paint is, is the ninety seven um, you know or what I guess it was January ninety eight um, Orange Bowl. Um, you got a lot of great stories, and uh, I think what you had a you had a, you had a streaker in your first game against UCLA, you know, and, and then you yeah. go against one of the greatest teams <laughs> to ever you know to ever assembled with Nebraska, and, you know, in that Orange Bowl, that from from start to finish, I mean, it had to be just a uh, you know a ton of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I it, it's a blur now, you know, because all the hits I took to the head, but um, yeah, I, everything was fun. Um, and, you know, it, I still remember that streaker because he ran right by Trey Teague. And the look on Trey's face, like, I'd never seen Trey so confused in my entire life. And, you know, this guy was hung like a donkey. So when they threw the little <laughs> towel over him, he was still hanging under the towel. And it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, I just remember people laughing still playing football. And that's, you know, that's the great thing about football. You never know what's going to happen. So you play – you, 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 obviously, you're, you're known for your on the field stuff, but then after football, you, 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 you know, you great things off the field. But I want to know about these promos that you and the thousand amateur back in college when you all would have these amateur wrestling tag team against <laughs> Billy Barron and Brad Lampley. It was just, it was dorm room wrestling. Of course, now it would be uh, probably a Me Too issue. Um, but no, we, we beat the hell out of each other. That, that was half of it. You could survive the dorms. You could survive football. Um, and the, you know, those days are long gone, but they were, they were a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that's all. I are there any videos? That. Are there any videos of these promos? Oh, hell no. They're, they're all gone. Long dead and gone. But I did have a short you time. You the thousand dollar man. We'll leave him. We'll, we won't say who that thousand dollar man is. Thousand dollar man. <laughs> yeah. But I, Bill, how, how grateful are you that there wasn't social media during your tenure at Tennessee? Oh, I would have never made it to sophomore year. There's no chance. I don't, so, know, I don't know if Peyton would have either. <laughs> it's a total different time, total different time. So since football was over, we, we've seen you on the History Channel. you traveled the world. Um, you would mentioned the wrestling things that you did afterwards. What, what what are you doing these days, man? What what let's let's catch up a little bit on life with build up. What you got going on, man? So I work full time as an executive for MGM uh, as, as a casino as a casino executive. I'm sorry, um, up here in the D.C. area, they got a place called National Harbor, brand new casino, it's gorgeous, whole nine yards. Uh, of course, it's shut down right now, like everything else. Um, but uh, I guess on the side, I am an author. So my first book will be published. Uh, it's actually 
The hard print is published and it just hit Amazon yesterday. Um, the website is not quite complete, but if you go to Amazon and you look for this book here, uh, it's called Meet Mr. Brackstone. It's about a serial killer in my hometown that I grew up in. Um, I'm pretty proud of it. It's a labor of love and uh, Page Publishing is putting it out. Um, great company up in New York. If anyone wants to work with a great publishing company, Page Publishing. Um, and again, that's Meet Mr. Brackstone. Just go to Amazon, type it in, you'll see it. What, what led you to, to, to write a book? What, what, what kind of got your creative juices going to write? So in high school, I was in, uh, in a club called Quill and Scroll. Uh, so I've always okay. loved to write. Uh, writing is something that I was always passionate about, but I never really had a lot of time to complete the, the journey, if you know what I mean. It was football or if it was the TV show or uh, getting involved in the casino industry. And just like every football player, once you're involved in something, you want to be, you know, you want to be the executive. You want to be on top. Um, so after I kind of got everything into place, um, you know, I decided to go ahead and do it and, and really set my head to it. And I got it done. And I'm already halfway through my second book. And this one's published. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Congratulations on, on that success there. What we'll let you I, I'll let you go with this last question. When, when you guys talk, when you're when you're former teammates and you guys on a group chat or you guys get together on, on whatever you get together. What, what's the, the top two or three things that, that you guys jump back into the fray talking about? Is it a game? Is it a dorm room story? I mean, is there, is there one of those that there's always something that it kind of navigates back to in your career during that time? Uh, it's usually the pranks, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, there was a, a prank war that lasted about a year. And it culminated uh, at one of the Citrus Bowls. I don't know if you remember a guy named Ralph Nelson. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Ralph and Will Newman were having this prank war. It was the worst war I've ever seen in my life. And they back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately, it ended with Ralph Nelson having a garbage can full of old chew tobacco, stuff out of the bathroom. I mean, everything you could imagine filled up. And he knocks on everyone's door, gets us all out of the dorms, goes down to Will Newman's door, knocks on it. He opens it and he just throws it all over <laughs> Will. And I mean, he's covered with, you know, old chewing tobacco and everything. I mean, it was just ass I think Billy Barron actually threw up in the hallway. That's how disgusting <laughs> the smell was. And we talk about we talk about that stuff quite often. Wow, that's awesome, man. That's terrific. Hey, li listen, I I'm so ex I'm so excited for your books and, th and that series you've got going. Congratulations on all the success that, that you have had with the casinos. Thanks for going down memory road with us here on this Rocky Top Rewind, talking about one of the great moments uh, in the 90s that really helped propel into Tennessee into a different stratosphere. We really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. That's right. Bill Duff joining us on the Blue Water Climate Control Rocky Top uh, VolQuest.com podcast. You'll probably have to add.